If you're new to telescopes and you're feeling just a little bit overwhelmed, well, don't worry, you've come to the right place. This is the Reflaxor channel, and in this video, I'll navigate you through all of the confusion, address many of the frustrating parts of this hobby, and get you comfortable with the telescope lingo in just a few minutes. So let's get started right away. The most important rule in all of astronomy is never point your telescope or binoculars or even your own eyeballs at the sun. It will cause permanent blindness. Almost all telescopes come with a dust cover or a cap of some sort. These are meant to keep dust and water out of the telescope. Those are the two enemies of telescopes. On a reflector style telescope like this one here, uh, they usually come with a big dust cover on the front. So go ahead and remove this like that. Now you may have noticed this has a couple of circles on the front. Ignore that for now. On refractors and small reflectors, they also have dust caps that come off. Larger viewfinders sometimes have dust caps that must be removed too. Sometimes they have a hinge and they fold down. Did you hear me say the two R words, refractor and reflector? Those are two of the most popular styles of telescope. It's important to know the basic difference. So it's time for my 60 second crash course in telescope styles. Refractor style telescopes have a glass lens at the front that bends the light as it comes down. We call this refraction. It bends that light until it reaches a focal point all the way down here. There's a tiny little bright image down at the back end of the telescope. Now at that point, we have this eyepiece that we look through. It takes that bright little image and it magnifies it many, many times so that our eyeball can see it and it looks much larger than what you would see if you look at it with the naked eye. The second type of telescope is a reflector style, like this kind. It doesn't have a big lens at the front. Instead, it's mostly hollow. And at the back, there's a big curved mirror. What happens is the light comes streaming through the inside of the telescope. It hits that curved mirror at the back and it bounces back towards the front. Now those lines of light are coming back and they're converging to a focal point uh, up, up near the front and they hit a mirror that's, it's a diagonal mirror and that light gets bounced out through the eyepiece right here. You may have noticed that all telescopes are tubular. Those tubes have two main jobs. The first job is to gather as much light as possible. The larger the diameter, the more light it gathers. Job number two is to take all of that light that the telescope tube has gathered and bend it to a focal point, whether that be through lenses or mirrors. Now that's all very well and good in taking the image and focusing it to a small point, but it still isn't magnified yet. This is where the eyepiece comes in. Inside these wonderful devices is a series of lenses that take that bright little image that is produced by the telescope and it makes it look huge. You can almost think of these eyepieces as compact microscopes. Hopefully your telescope came with at least two of them. No matter how varied they may all look, the magnification they produce all comes down to their focal length measured in millimeters. Sounds complicated, I know, but I promise it's not. Written on every eyepiece is a number followed by the letters MM. The numbers themselves generally range from three all the way up to 40, sometimes even larger. To use popular lingo, that's a range of about three millimeters all the way up to 40 millimeters. This one has a nine, this one has a six. The key takeaway is that the bigger the number, the less it will magnify. And the smaller the number, the more it will magnify. If you only take one detail from this video, please let it be that one. Physical size of the eyepiece has no bearing on the magnification. The only thing that matters is the little number inscribed on the eyepiece. So bigger mm equals less magnification and smaller mm equals more magnification. For example, here I have two eyepieces, both of which have 30 millimeters written on them. Which one do you think produces more magnification? It's a trick question, right? Since they both have 30 millimeters written on them, they both have the same magnification. The only difference is that this monster has a much wider view, almost a porthole view. We can talk about that in a different video. Now that you're an expert on eyepieces, I'm gonna share my top tip. Always start with the lowest magnification. In other words, you pick the eyepiece that has the biggest number on it. In this case, we have a 32 millimeter. This is my lowest magnification eyepiece. Start with this one first. That means you'll be looking at whatever object you're looking at on a very low power magnification. So think of it as taking a very large view of what you're trying to find. Then once you get what you're trying to find circled, 
you can pull this one out and put in perhaps a nine millimeter or a higher power, you might say, eyepiece. And then this, of course, this is a six millimeter eyepiece. Uh, this will give you lots of magnification. But of course, you don't want to start out with high magnification because that makes it harder to find what you're looking at in the sky. So always start with the bigger number first. Eyepieces sit inside of a focuser tube. You can tighten it down on the eyepiece. Focuser tubes have these little wheels on the side that move the focuser tube in and out. Like that. That's because there are always slight nuances in how close your eyepiece needs to be to the main lens or the main mirror of the telescope. And this focuser tube allows you to make small adjustments. Don't be surprised if the first time you put your eyepiece in that you see a blurry image or even black, but we're gonna talk about that later. So before you get too concerned, keep turning this wheel until the focuser tube moves all the way in. And if that doesn't give you a sharp picture, well, just go the opposite way and slowly move it all the way out. Eventually, you should see a sharp picture show up. This is, of course, assuming that your telescope is pointed at something other than total blackness, and we'll get to that in a second. A special note, if you have a reflector style telescope, that's the kind with mirrors, uh, there's an extra complication. Even when the image is blurry and unfocused, you can sometimes see a sharp picture of a circle that's right in the middle of your image. In that case, you're actually seeing the outline of this diagonal mirror right here. You're seeing the back end of that. It looks like a little circle. The way to get around that is you just keep moving that focuser tube in and out, all the way in and all the way out, until you finally get the object that you're looking for to come into focus. Now, of course, you can test this whole setup before it gets too dark outside. After the sun sets, point your telescope at a faraway tree or a power pole. Try the different eyepieces. You can go through all the ones that you have. It's pretty cool. Note that whatever you look at has to be kind of far away, actually, in order for the focus to work. Telescopes are designed to look at things very far away. Now we need to figure out how to get the telescope pointed at the cool stuff up in the sky such as the moon, or the planets, or maybe even the Orion Nebula. Almost every telescope out there, hopefully yours included, has something that will help you do this. It's called a viewfinder, or a, a finder scope that's mounted on the side. There's a lot of different styles, actually. Uh, some of them are just simply tiny, low-power telescopes, like this guy right here, mounted on the side. Sometimes there's a red dot finder, or there's a Telrad. Let's talk a little bit about the different finder devices that help you point the telescope in the proper direction. This first example is a red dot finder. This is showing up on a lot of telescopes. It's actually quite popular. This is mounted right on the side of your telescope. It has a couple of adjustments and we're gonna talk about that. But first of all, it uses a watch battery to power it. And there's usually a little piece of plastic in here that you have to pull out in order for it to work. In order to turn these on and off, there's a small knob here. Now, don't get this confused with this knob and this knob. This is the power knob. Now, this it clicks on, and then it's adjustable. So you can turn this about half of a circle. So that makes the red dot that shows up on this glass go from very dim to very bright. And if you hear the click, that means it's off. In fact, when you bring your telescope in at night, please be sure to turn this off because it will kill the battery, the little watch battery up here. You're going to look at it through this direction. To demonstrate this, I'm going to go ahead and turn it on by turning this knob right here and turn a little bit until we see a bright red light. There we go. See the red dot? And if you turn it all the way, it gets really bright. All right. So that red dot is more or less focused to infinity. It's pretty neat how it works, actually. You can almost leave both eyes open while you're using this. One eye looks through this viewfinder or this red dot finder, and the other eye is just looking next to it at the object in the sky. Make sure you turn it off, though, when you're done. If everything is lined up, that red dot, once you move your telescope around and you point that red dot at whatever your target is, whether it be the moon or a planet or a star, then the telescope itself should be pointing at that object. In a little bit, I'm gonna explain how to make sure that's the case. And for this particular device, the way that you aim it is, if this needs to go up and down, you turn this knob back here. If it needs to change left and right, it's this front knob up here. It goes clockwise or counterclockwise and it slowly moves the red dot left and right. And of course, this one moves the red dot slowly up and down. You'll have to adjust this once you put the telescope together. Generally speaking, once you set it, it doesn't move a lot unless the mount itself is kind of sloppy. 
But other than that, these work great, and I try to put these on all of my telescopes. Anyways, I recommend these red dot finders, and they're becoming more and more popular. Next up are the straight through optical. It's like a little telescope itself, a little refractor telescope. And this one is a right angle corrected image. Let's talk about this one first. And this is kind of a lower cost model, but it still works. It has these three set screws that help you aim it or adjust the aim. This one also happens to have a little hole in it that lets you get a really rough sight on what you're looking for. And then you can use the actual finder scope here to get a more magnification. I, I'm not a big fan of these because the aiming of this makes it a little bit tricky. I actually ended up replacing these with one of those red dot finders on a telescope. This is by far my favorite. This is the right angle corrected image. It's called a Ratchy or Rassy, something like that. The, the interesting thing is this is what you see in here is what you get. Uh, you may know that when you look through a telescope, the images are either flipped or they're upside down. Depends on the type of telescope or if you have an angle. But this is called a right angle corrected image. Uh, this is just a low power telescope, basically. You can see it's got a lens on the front. It has this diagonal on the back. Correct me, there may actually be a prism in there. But when you look through here, what you see has the proper orientation of what you're looking at. It's not flipped side to side or upside down. This also has a wonderful benefit of you can look down into this. If you're using this kind, you basically either have to you know crank your neck down to look at it because this is a straight through viewer. But this one, you can just kind of peer down into it and it works really well. This also has adjustment screws on it as well. This is kind of interesting. This one is spring-loaded, so this is always pushing. And then if the viewfinder needs to go right and left, you use this adjustment screw, and if it needs to go up and down, use this adjustment screw. But this one is always spring-loaded. It's always pushing. You can't really adjust this one. This is my preferred. Uh, on my telescopes, I have a combination of this one and the red dot finder. The reason is that the red dot finder allows you to get to where you want to go really fast, and then this one helps you move in, do some fine tuning. This one's great for looking for planets and stars. And I should also mention this one has crosshairs in it too. So this, I use this one when I'm trying to track the International Space Station. I use the crosshairs in this. So anyways, next up uh, is the Telrad. So the Telrad is kind of like the red dot finder, except it has, instead of a dot, it has circles. And it has circles of varying sizes. And if you look, one of these circles is uh, gonna be basically the same diameter as the moon. Um, it's pretty handy. People use Telrads to do what's called star hopping. Uh, there are special books and apps that basically tell you how far away certain stars are away from other stars. So you can see in this image here, uh, the Telrad projects this pretty cool, uh, like a heads up display circle. For any of these to work, we have to assume that your telescope and the finder are both perfectly aligned, pointing at the same location. However, this is rarely the case right out of the box. Fortunately, all of them have adjustment knobs. Here's the general outline procedure. Start by putting in the lowest magnification eyepiece that you have in the focuser tube. That's the one with the biggest number. And through trial and error, moving the telescope, look through here and try to find a bright object, whether that's the moon or a bright star. But work as hard as you can to try to get it and try to get it centered right in the view. Now, without moving the telescope, look through your viewfinder. Here's the red dot finder. And here, of course, is the right angle corrected image finder. Look through here and see how your target object is centered in the view. If it's not, adjust either the up and down or the left and right knobs. On this one, the up and down knob is on the back and the right and left knob is right up here on the front on the side. On this one, the up and down is right here and the side to side is over here. So adjust these until your target is right in the middle of your viewfinder. Now, jump back to the eyepiece, make sure that the object you're looking at is still in the middle. Of course, everything in the sky moves slowly, so make sure it's in the middle, and just go back and forth, fine tuning, so that everything is lined up. From that point on, you should be able to use these viewfinders to generally pointed at your object of interest, and it's much easier to find them in these, right? Because these are super low magnification. This has no magnification. It's just a red dot that you point wherever you want it to look. And from that point on, when you look through the viewfinder, you should see what you want to find. If you want to dive deeper into these viewfinders and finder scopes, I have a whole video dedicated to all the possible types of these that you can have. And it also talks about 
fixing and troubleshooting all of the weird things that can happen with these finder scopes. I'll put a link to that video down in the description box. To find out what's available in the sky to look at, there's a couple of tools that you can use. These are pretty cool. These are called planispheres. They've got this wheel that lets you dial in the month and time. They're two-sided, so they're pretty cool, and you can get these on Amazon. Here's a small one that you can take camping. The other thing that I use a lot of are I use uh, apps for my smartphone. I use a bunch of different ones. I use Google Sky Map. I use uh, Sky Safari or Stellarium or Starseek. But be sure to, you know, give them a try and see which one works best for you. It's not very often that something comes into our hobby that I would describe as a true game changer. This is called Astro Hopper. It's a free app that runs on any smartphone. It's created by a developer named Artyom Bayless, and he just gives it away for free. I have an entire video dedicated to how to get this and how to use it. I'll put a link in the description box below. Your telescope may have come with something called a Barlow lens. It's usually a long tube that says 2x on it or 3x or something like that. And it's actually a little bit of magic as far as I'm concerned. If you put this between the focuser tube and your eyepiece, it will double the magnification power of the eyepiece. So for example, you would put it in the focuser tube, and lock that in. Then you would put the eyepiece in there and lock that in. And of course, you would have to refocus it by turning the knobs. So for example, if you only have one eyepiece, and let's say it's a 20 millimeter, if you use it with this Barlow lens, well, then it's like inserting an eyepiece that has 10 millimeters written on it. It effectively doubles the magnification power of it. One way to look at this is that a Barlow lens will effectively give you an extra eyepiece for every eyepiece that you physically own. So for example, if you have a 30 millimeter, 20 millimeter, 10 millimeter eyepiece, that's three eyepieces, if you use it in conjunction with the Barlow, that'll give you a 30 millimeter. And then with the Barlow, it turns it into a 15. The 20 will be turned into a 10. And of course, the 10 will be turned into a 5. So the, the Barlow lens is a pretty neat accessory to have. Telescopes gather way more light than your eyeball does. That's all good for producing sharp images of the moon when magnified. But unfortunately, the moon can be so bright that it actually hurts your eyes or, or messes up your night vision. So your telescope may have come with one of these. It's a moon filter. It makes it easier on the eyes. All you do is have, it has threads, and most eyepieces have threads on the bottom, and this screws into the bottom like this. It's a little bit tricky. These are really fine threads, so don't cross-thread them. You screw it in all the way until it's tight. Then you take your focuser tube and you put your eyepiece in. All right, and then you go about looking at the moon. Warning, this will not prevent permanent blindness if you try to use this with the sun. So again, never, ever, ever point a telescope at the sun under any circumstances. If you want to attach your smartphone to your telescope, there's a lot of different adapters available. I've reviewed them pretty much all, and I have custom videos for each of them. But in all the videos, I do talk about the pros and cons of each of these, and I talk about how to set up the camera app software on your smartphone to take best advantage of the astrophotography features. This is the generic one that comes with a lot of telescopes. This is the Celestron XYZ that a lot of people like. And this is one that, it keeps changing name. It started out as AccuView. It's made by a company called Move Shoot Move. Uh, I'll put a link to the most modern version of this. It's all metal and it keeps things really lined up. I, I actually really, really like this one. Uh, these two both work with two inch eyepieces. If you're interested in an expanded review on any of these, I put links to those videos down in the description box. It's important that we talk about the red light. If you ever go to a star party or an astronomy club meeting that's meeting outside, you'll notice that a lot of people either have a red headlight or they have a flashlight with a red filter on it. The reason for that is that red light uh, doesn't really affect your night vision. So as the sun goes down and things get dark outside, your eyes actually adjust and become more sensitive to light. Uh, you've experienced this if you ever walk out of a dark movie theater and you're, suddenly your eyes are just very sensitive to the light. Well, 
At night, your eyes become very sensitive to even just modest light. Uh, but red light does not affect that. That means that you can basically, you can read maps, you can read sky charts and that kind of a thing with just red light. And it won't make your eyes lose their sensitivity, especially if you're looking at deep sky objects like galaxies or nebulas. One quick note, your night vision can instantly be ruined if somebody turns on a bright phone or if you happen to see a passing car and you look at the headlights, uh, then it's going to take about 15 to 20 minutes for your eyes to adjust back down to the night vision that really helps out when you're stargazing. Well, we've covered so much in this video. I hope that it reduced some of the frustration. If you want to dive deeper into how to align the viewfinder on top of your telescope, well, check out this video over here. And if you want to learn how to attach a smartphone adapter and set up the camera software on your phone, then check out this video over here. But most importantly, no matter what telescope you have, take it outside tonight and have a blast. If you enjoyed this video, please push the like button. Thanks for watching and clear skies, everybody.